it just minimized. It's misbehaving. Yep. It is. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Hopefully everyone uh, can see the PowerPoint. Uh, the screen just minimized for a second. My name is Craig Tice. I'm the superintendent of schools of Fayetteville Manlia Central School District, and I'm joined joined this morning by uh, some of our district office administrators and our director of facilities. Uh, if they would like to take a moment to introduce themselves and their position, they will be available for some question and answers as we get towards the end of the session. I'm Hello. Jeff Gordon, Assistant Superintendent for Personnel. Hello, I'm Lisa Deneen, the Assistant Superintendent for Special Services. Hello, Hi, I'm oh. from uh, Buildings and Grounds, Director of Facilities. And Laurel Chiesa, Director of Instructional Technology. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we may be uh, joined by uh, Bill Furlong, our Assistant Superintendent for Business. He is in an, another meeting this morning. And then Dr. Mary Coughlin is uh, filling in for me at an OCM BOCES meeting about regional schooling options going forward. Uh, and so hopefully she'll be able to join us before the end, uh, but I can certainly fill you in later on on one of the slides. Our agenda uh, for today is, uh, we'll start with a slide deck presentation, which will include a summary of the most commonly asked questions that uh, the district is in receipt of uh, from all of you. Uh, we'll follow that up with an interactive Q&A session via YouTube chat room feature, and our district clerk, Sarah Gridley, will uh, read off the questions and certainly allow uh, the team or yours truly here to respond to a specific question. And then I know we have some time allotted uh, for today's meeting, but a number of us have to attend an administrative cabinet meeting as we plan for the reopening of school. So for any questions that we do not get to today, please feel free to use the Let's Talk communication platform uh, to log in your questions. The Let's Talk tab is available on our school district website. In terms of a brief history, as we uh, travel down memory lane, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic precipitated the closure of schools on March 16th. Uh, we scrambled at that time. The Board of Education held an emergency meeting on uh, Sunday the 15th. Uh, we certainly uh, moved our things very quickly, a staff development day up front. We used a couple of an emergency closing days and then instruction began on Thursday, the 19th of March. Uh, most of the instruction was asynchronous. A lot of our teachers did uh, do a wonderful job going above and beyond that, but certainly we were thrust into a situation that none of us had anticipated uh, and tried to make the best of it. And that not just goes for the students and teachers, but the families who were suddenly uh, filling in as uh, teaching paraprofessionals on the home front and trying to uh, move us forward in so many ways. So uh, my hat's off to everybody as we sort of suffered through that together. Uh, following that up in June, as you know, we did a uh, parent guardian family feedback survey. We certainly wanted some authentic feedback on uh, what went well, what additional supports were needed. And I'll talk a little bit about the summary of that, reason, the, that data in a second. We also did a teacher professional development needs assessment as well on the things they felt they needed in order to do a better job as well. That helped us schedule our professional development opportunities for over the summer for July and August. As far as the parent survey, uh, one of the things, uh, these were the four main areas, uh, families who needed connections. Uh, asynchronous was not good enough. They wanted additional synchronous opportunities. Uh, office hours, not just for the students, but for parents as well. They wanted to be able to tap into the teachers for certain pedagogical tips. 
and they just knew that uh, that would be important as well, including uh, flip classroom models, being able to take videos and be able to review those videos with their children when they returned home from work uh, later in the day. They were worried about engagement, uh, motivating the students. Uh, uh, they just felt uh, it was intriguing at first, but as one week turned into uh, the four months uh, at the end of the school year, engagement and motivation became uh, problematic as uh, students uh, had difficulty following through if they were not connected to their teachers. Uh, flexibility, that came through loud and clear that certainly some parents and families wanted more time during the day, but they also wanted the option of being able to work with their children uh, in the evening and to be able to review assignments and so forth. So they did not want one size fits all uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And then finally, less screen time. Uh, again, we often think of this generation of students enjoying a lot of uh, screen time with whatever games or videos or live streaming services uh, in terms of watching their favorite television shows. But at the same time, they felt that the use of additional print materials, paper, pencil uh, assignments would still be important uh, if those could be delivered to the home. Uh, if the students could hand carry them home, it would mean certainly less screen time and uh, allowing the students a little uh, diversity in carrying out their assignments. As far as the teacher's needs assessment, I give credit to Dr. Coughlin and her teacher leaders throughout the district. Uh, they identified some summer staff development, much of which, as you can see, uh, was based on an online platform. What are the things that we could do better? And it was teachers training teachers. So uh, it certainly uh, was great to be able to uh, deploy uh, many of our teacher leaders and lead teachers and helping their colleagues as peer coaches to be able to share some uh, tricks of the trade uh, and to allow, uh, again, to address those parent issues of engagement and connections. As we continue down memory lane, uh, you'll also remember we did a school reopening survey in uh, early July. It uh, coincided with the uh, New York State Education Department and the Board of Regents doing regional task force meetings throughout the state. Uh, our board president, Marissa Joy Mims, and our high school principal, Dr. Ray Kilmer, were tapped to participate in addition to perhaps some of you as well. Uh, and some teachers uh, were involved and the idea was to get some regional feedback throughout the state uh, that would inform the guidance that the state uh, had planned to release in mid-July. So that, that survey took place uh, in early July. And believe it or not, we floated a number of the ideas that we knew those regional task force meetings were talking about. And I know some of you sent emails to me or let's talk saying you like this idea, you didn't like that idea. But really what we were trying to do is at least share with you the fact that uh, these were the different options being floated around and considered by the Board of Regents uh, during those regional task force meetings. As far as our reopening survey uh, feedback, uh, one of the things that came through loud and clear from all of you uh, was consistency uh, and flexibility, uh, fluidity, uh, having a teacher of record, maintaining the FM brand, which we have all come to respect. And so having FM students with FM teachers was very important to the respondents of the survey. Uh, capacity, uh, people wanted their children in school. Uh, they uh, want us to honor the CDC regulations, but for many of our families, it was important uh, even though some of us educators bristle at the thought of thinking of ourselves as daycare, uh, we know we're so much more, but uh, parents needed that flexibility uh, for us to maximize capacity to be able to return to work uh, for themselves. And then finally, equity. This came through loud and clear as well, that uh, equity for all grade levels. I know some school districts were considering uh, options such as bringing in the younger grades, other districts were bringing in older grades such as seniors and some of our parents advocated for that as well. Uh, but what was again loud and clear was equity for all grade levels. There was no throwaway generation that would allow, uh, you know, that would be skewed to allow one 
uh, age level to attend at the exclusion of another grade level. Continuing with our history, as you know, the Department of Health released their guidance uh, in mid-July. This was due, as many of you know, in mid-June. Uh, so better late than never, they released the guidance in uh, mid-July. And you'll remember the governor at that time uh, talked about the DOH guidance of uh, reopening for in-person instruction. At the time, uh, again, you may remember, he was fighting with Mayor de Blasio in New York City about who would make the decisions. He said it would not be the mayor, it would be the governor. And so certainly reopening was one of the points of uh, discussion. There was also monitoring uh, the spread of the disease. And we heard a little bit of that from the governor uh, later on in the month talking about uh, the ability for schools to stay open or to close depending on a regional testing, uh, regional testing results for a particular area. Uh, also in that DOH guidance was containment. Uh, what would happen if a student faculty member was exhibiting uh, symptoms of COVID-19? And then finally, what would precipitate school closure? Would it be a local decision? Would it be the Onondaga County Department of Health and the county executive? Or would it be the governor himself in the event of uh, regional uh, uptick and resurgence of the virus? State Ed, uh, a few days later uh, in the afternoon, late afternoon, early evening of the Thursday of that week, released their guidance. They hit their mark. Uh, as you know, sometimes I tease State Ed, uh, uh, but they actually said mid-July and they delivered in mid-July. It was uh, uh, the governor's office and the Department of Health that was a little late. Um, and, but they hit it in mid-July and they came out with their guidance uh, of the 89 assurances. And uh, what was interesting here, it covered a plethora of areas uh, uh, from, as you can see, communications, health and safety, social, emotional, transportation, food service, absenteeism, technology, and on and on and on. And as superintendents throughout the state, we all had to provide assurances in those 89 subcategories and my choices as you've heard some of you heard me tease was yes yes or yes i could not answer no every field was asterisk uh, so it was a required field i could not enter anything but a yes so uh, and i'm stressing this because i'm going to come back to this later our plan is really uh, centered around that department of health guidance and the 89 assurances and i know information is changing daily, which I think complicates things in part because um, I think all of you are staying in touch with the media and uh, new ideas that are coming out or new regulations or executive orders, new research, and I think that all plays in. But again, as a snapshot in time, our work was done uh, based on the guidance that was released the week of July 13th. So then what did we do? Uh, well, life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So we started uh, working on the Department of Health compliance the week of the 13th. Uh, next up, the week of the 20th, we pulled together some teacher leaders, instructional forums, building site-based teams to work on the state ed compliance work, the 89 assurances in terms of developing our plan. And this, I mean, as you can imagine, with given an impossible task of only three weeks to pull this all together, the building level teams led by the principals worked very hard in putting it uh, all together. And why? Well, the week of the 27th, as some of you know, uh, there were advisory committee meetings. Uh, uh, many districts held one advisory committee meeting, FM uh, held six. Uh, we did one for each level elementary, uh, middle, and high school. We also had a physician's advisory committee, sort of a medical review board, if you will. We had a FMTA advisory committee meeting with the union stewardship. And then last but not least, a parent council advisory committee where we uh, tapped into all the parents who had volunteered and expressed an interest in taking a look at the plan. And their feedback was certainly critical. Those are the advisory committees that I just highlighted. And uh, they had a chance to look at the draft plan, in part because we had to post the plan 
on uh, July 31st. So we did post the plan on the 31st, not only to our website, but to both state ed and the Department of Health. Uh, we also, at that time, following the posting of the plan, sent out a family perception questionnaire. It was a very simple questionnaire. It talked about uh, your gut feelings, whether you were ready to have your child return to school or to avail themselves of the remote instruction. We asked about child care because we knew that was weighing heavily on the minds of our families. And then finally, transportation and whether or not uh, you would avail yourselves of school transportation uh, services. So it was a simple three uh, part question. Many families completed that questionnaire, but many did not. Uh, many said and told me in no uncertain terms that they would prefer to wait until Labor Day. They wanted as much information and data uh, at their fingertips to make an informed decision. And I, I totally understand that. But uh, as you can imagine, uh, the district is trying to plan ahead. We're trying to plan for the reopening of school. So I will reference this a little bit later in the presentation, but this was a tipping point. Uh, we were trying to go out and get people's gut reactions. And I know families were worried whether it was binding or not, and it certainly wasn't. And we tried to clarify that and even extend the survey, but it sent a clear message that the district was already putting pencil to paper in order to plan. We could not wait any longer. And what were those questionnaire results that I just referred to? Well, 65% indicated a desire to return to in-person instruction across all grade levels, uh, which was pretty consistent with earlier uh, surveys. 25% believe that childcare would be a problem for their family in terms of uh, returning to work. And then 50% said they would avail themselves of school district transportation. We already have a number of our students, in particular at the high school level, that drive themselves to school. We have a number of parents who transport their children as well. So our fleet is already uh, at a partial capacity. So this 50% was interesting. Uh, it looks like more parents are going to elect to drive their children to school, but we still have to provide a space on the bus in order to uh, allow the children to return. So then finally, the governor, as you know, said schools are to reopen on August 7th. Uh, I think that surprised a lot of us. Uh, many were predicting that he would say that uh, they would be closed. As you know, there has been a battle between the state level and federal level between Republicans and Democrats. And I do not want to get into a political debate here, but we also know because uh, education is funded by the state and there are some federal monies that pass through uh, the Capitol in Albany, uh, we knew that this debate uh, would certainly, the uh, politics at the federal and state levels would trickle down to the local levels. Uh, right now we're having 20% of our state aid withheld uh, by Albany. As you know, the state budget uh, needs a lot of work, uh, and I believe them, uh, but they are withholding uh, money from the school districts, uh, all school districts, not just FM, that we were counting on. What was also interesting is following his announcement uh, over the weekend, the 8th, 9th, and then finally the 10th, the governor was sharing his concerns about the school plans. He said, again, the governor mentioned earlier in the month that he would make the decision, not the mayor. And now he was saying parents and teachers would make the decision. And I totally understand that. Uh, parents have to feel that the environment is going to be safe for their child, or they may have pre existing health conditions on the home front that they do not want their child to attend school. So I certainly understand uh, giving parents that uh, option. And I certainly understand them talking about the teachers. Uh, teachers uh, coming to work as essential workers now, much like the medical professionals uh, who have helped us since the beginning of the pandemic now find themselves on the front lines as well. And uh, whether there's, uh, even at the medical level, whether there's uh, personal protective equipment uh, for these individuals, we still know in a hospital setting and a medical care setting that uh, certainly some of our medical professionals have suffered and have contracted the virus, even uh, doing their work uh, in spite of the best intentions and protections and uh, so forth. So certainly uh, teachers needed to weigh in on this too, as well as the parents. 
And then, uh, and I say this tongue in cheek, uh, the 10th was 107 districts didn't submit their plans or so the governor thought. Uh, actually, we were in good company. We were listed as one of those districts along with some many other high performing districts like Syosset and Webster. Uh, and it turns out, and I had a chance to speak with a lovely person from the New York State Department of Health who did say that our plan was there, it just was diverted to the business side. Uh, there were different hyperlinks for assurances and the upload of the plan. Uh, when we uploaded ours to state ed, the upload of the plan and the uh, uh, certification, the assurance, were all on the same hyperlink. Uh, for the state, because they deal with businesses too, everything was on different hyperlinks. So for the districts who uploaded their plan and then certified, uh, they were given credit for it. For uh, FM and all those 107 other districts, we certified first and then uploaded, again, two different hyperlinks. And for some reason or another, it ended up diverted to the business side of the house. So it was there. We resubmitted doing it in the correct sequencing and so they certainly have our plan. Uh, it was posted in plain sight on the website, and uh, we have not heard another word uh, from any of the state officials about it. As you know, on the 10th, the governor also mandated public meetings, this being the first of three. I know we had a question, does, uh, do parents have to attend all three? They do not, unless they like to hear me speak about the same PowerPoint. Uh, the meetings were just an opportunity to give everyone a Different, uh, different opportunity at a different time, uh, whether mornings work, afternoons work, or evenings work over the course of uh, the middle of the week uh, to try to get any questions answered. So we did mandate three meetings, five meetings for the larger school districts, the big five. Uh, the governor also mandated that three addenda be added to all reopening plans. You may recall that he said they were indecipherable, uh, but he wanted the COVID testing outline, the contact tracing outline, and a description of the remote learning by August 14th. We have since put that information up on our website. I know some of you have indicated you've appreciated the extra, uh, the additional information. And as you can see too, from the testing and contact tracing, it's a partnership with Onondaga County Department of Health uh, in terms of the testing and the tracing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, so we are doing that in concert with Dr. Gupta and uh, County Executive Ryan McMahon in terms of deploying their uh, resources as we go through the testing. And we heard that from our Physicians Advisory Committee loud and clear that uh, really to stem the tide uh, as far as the virus goes until there is a treatment or a cure it's going to be dependent on testing, testing, and more testing. So going forward, where does that leave us? Well, given all the feedback, given the history, given all the surveys that we've received, uh, we have placed all K-12 students uh, in a hybrid classroom, either cohort A or cohort B. That is the default. Uh, some of you, or all of you, will be receiving a survey later today uh, which is due by uh, Monday. This is the final uh, questionnaire for you to opt in uh, to the remote learning or opt out of the hybrid learning. But we had to plan accordingly. We had to get our plan started. Uh, there are just a myriad of different uh, variables that come into uh, planning for a new school year, even in a routine year. So you can imagine this year has been anything but routine. Uh, so uh, this, your children have been deployed in either cohort A or cohort B. Uh, cohort A, as you uh, heard, is Monday, Tuesday, cohort B, Thursday, Friday. Others preferred a little bit more symmetrical approach. We took it as uh, more important to bring the cohorts in in sequence, feeling if we get the students on Monday, we'll get them Tuesday as well and that it was important to have that consistency and also to be able to clean the buildings uh, with a deep cleaning on Wednesday, which is part of the plan. So Wednesdays will be professional development uh, for the teachers on a regular basis, office hours for both students and parents, the deep cleaning as well as asynchronous learning. And we just felt we had a better chance in terms of the disinfecting of the buildings uh, to occur on that Wednesday in between cohorts. And then again on the weekend uh, before cohort A returns on Monday. 
So as I said, families may elect the remote option. Uh, we would like to get your input uh, by uh, August 24th. If we don't, keep in mind the default is the hybrid model. Uh, so that your child is already placed in a classroom. Again, if you're looking to opt in or opt out, depending on how you look at it, uh, for the remote learning, uh, that decision is due by Monday the 21st, to uh, be able to give folks the weekend to plan accordingly. Uh, the Board of Ed, uh, based on an administrative re uh, recommendation, was to move our staff development days up front. Uh, so we already had the second and third scheduled. We've moved up our November uh, and our May 2021 staff development days uh, that were around the general election and the school budget vote up to the beginning of the school year. We certainly want to be able to hit the ground running and we're going to need every minute of those four days in order to make sure we can uh, walk through and prepare for the arrival of the students. I know I received some questions. What does that mean on the general election day if we get that far and the governor hasn't shut schools down or the school budget vote in May? And we certainly could use remote learning days on those days as well if needed um, and because of the additional foot traffic in the building. Again, assuming there is not a mail-in uh, ballots that will be used at the time. The first day for students is going to be September 10th. It is mandated that students review videos uh, regarding respiratory hygiene, masks, social distancing, and hand hygiene. We will have those available on our website and social media. We will push those out. And so the 10th, the teachers will be uh, sending out uh, via Schoology or emails, contacts with the students just to say hi uh, for attendance purposes but directing the students to be able to review those videos in advance of their arrival, at least for cohort B on that Friday. So for the first day of instruction for uh, cohort B will be Friday the 11th, uh, and that will include Chromebook distribution. Cohort A, uh, that should say the 14th. Uh, so cohort A will be uh, on the 14th that Monday. Uh, and again, Chromebook distribution. So let's get into some common questions and concerns uh, that were articulated through the email and the Let's Talk uh, platform. I'll try to get to all the uh, common ones and then I know you, many of you will have specific questions as a follow up and we will open that up in terms of the chat feature on YouTube. So question one, uh, will families have the option of selecting the remote learning model? As I said earlier, yes, families will have the option of choosing the remote only option. It could be, be because of uh, medical concerns. It could be uh, for whatever reason, uh, families certainly have that option. I know some school districts were not providing that option, but for us, we knew that the FM community would want uh, that option. And as we saw in the survey results, 30 to 35%, about a third of you will avail yourselves of the remote uh, learning option. We know in our heart of hearts, it does not replace the in-person instruction. In fact, during one of our advisory committees uh, with the parents, it was crystal clear that everybody wished that they could hit rewind and go back to yesterday or yesteryear uh, in terms of having the students uh, and the teachers together. Uh, we know that is optimal. And so we know that hybrid or remote learning isn't optimal and that we will certainly make the best of it. But we also wanted to give parents that option. Uh, next question, will parents be able to switch back and forth? Uh, some, I think, want to dabble in the hybrid in person. And then uh, if something happens in terms of research or a media story about a resurgence in the virus, would they be able to switch to remote? And yes, you are allowed to make that switch in accordance uh, with the FAPE legislation, free appropriate public education. Uh, you're certainly allowed to do that. We will ask for those families that choose the remote only option I think originally in our plan, it said a year. Some districts were wrestling with, should it be a semester? Others are a marking period or quarter. Just for our own sanity, we would prefer to try to deal with it at a marking period at a time. But uh, yes, any of you could uh, come back and forth at, at your discretion. Uh, we will, and that's one of the reasons we're required to take attendance daily, whether we're in 
uh, remote model or uh, an in-person model with the hybrid, teachers will be required to take attendance uh, for all students every day of the week, including Wednesdays, by the way. Uh, will students and staff have to wear masks and socially distance themselves? Yes, uh, masks and social distance are required. I know some of the paperwork that came out said masks or social distance, and then we had clarifications uh, from the Department of Health and State Ed that said masks and social distance. Uh, so we had clarifications of the clarifications. So as we kidded earlier, we know that uh, the landscape is changing, sometimes a little bit too quickly here, but masks and social distance are required. That's one of the reasons we went with the hybrid model uh, for capacity in terms of using the buildings. Uh, we just need to be able to spread all the students out in those six foot distances. I know we had some questions, but why can't we use uh, uh, a church or a synagogue or a fire department or YMCA or any of those other facilities that would require uh, the Department of Facilities Planning at State Ed to approve those facilities. But really at the surface level, if you think about it, who do we send? Uh, does uh, you know your child go to the school and the Tice children go to the you know abandoned fire department or abandoned gas station? I mean, we just have to think about that in terms of the equity. Uh, but one of the reasons we went with the high, uh, ended up going with the hybrid model was because of those class sizes uh, being maxed out in terms of the distancing and uh, wearing the masks. We will provide hand sanitizer uh, in each of the rooms uh, as well. Will students be able to use their lockers and cubbies? No, uh, the guidance says limited. Uh, we will not have the students use their lockers and cubbies. Uh, what will winter bring with winter coats? Uh, we'll have to revisit that, assuming we're still open. As many of you know, this is balanced on the head of a pin. And if there is a resurgence of the virus or if it's masked because of uh, the uh, flu season and cold season, uh, we might not have to worry about uh, winter coats. But for now, in terms of pedestrian traffic flow in the buildings, uh, lockers and cubbies uh, will not be used. Are fans permitted to operate in the classroom? Not when the students are present. Uh, windows should be open to allow as much air circulation as possible. Uh, we will have indoor spaces supported with air filtration systems and some of the special ed classrooms as well. Uh, MERV filtration, as you know, has been required. Uh, and then MERV 9 for some of our older units that cannot take a MERV 13 filter. So we will try to augment those others with airflow handlers that will uh, distribute some of that uh, additional air through the MERV-9 filters. Will water fountains be operational? Yes, bottle fill stations only. Uh, some of the water fountain bubblers in the classrooms will be turned off. Some of the buildings just have those bubblers, so we will have to certainly sanitize and clean those on a regular basis. But again, we're trying to uh, reduce the number of high touch areas, as you can imagine, in the buildings in order to help prevent the spread of the virus. Will PPE be available for staff and students? Yes, the district must provide one mask per teacher, staff member per day, and one mask per student per week. I know a lot of you have purchased masks in advance. You told me that's certainly applicable. You may have seen some research come out uh, that the gaiters or the bandanas are not being recommended anymore, that it should be the masks. Uh, so uh, again, this changes constantly. We would recommend the masks. Uh, uh, and I think uh, if you have purchased them at home, that's fine. Uh, it's just that, uh, again, if students feel comfortable wearing uh, their own mask from home, that's fine. If they do not, we must provide them uh, here at school. We must provide them on the bus as well. We cannot deny a student uh, going on to a bus for not having a mask. Uh, so we must provide the mask to the students and nurses will be outfitted accordingly with the N95 masks. Will staff and students be required to complete a daily health screening? Yes, for staff members. 
uh, will be required. Uh, we're trying to use a software app uh, to, as a tickler to remind staff every morning. Students are required to complete a health screening periodically. So we will probably send that out periodically via the school messenger alert system. Will students be screened for body temperature upon arrival to school? Uh, yes, they will be screened upon entrance to the school building by trained staff members wearing appropriate PPE. So that will be new to us. Uh, accordingly, uh, as the schedules are released, I'm going to have to ask your indulgence uh, to follow those drop off and pick up schedules. Same with the buses. The buses will be staggering their arrival. We cannot keep the students on the buses, so they will not be waiting in a line like they have in the past. We'll be staggering them in. Our bus transportation, if you can think of a, a old west wagon wheel in the old days, the buses would go out to the perimeter of a school attendance zone area and then head into the axle. Uh, the hub of the wheel, which would be the school building at the center. Uh, now, if it's more of a target approach with concentric circles, the buses will be out on the perimeter. The bus closest to the school building will also probably be acting like a taxi service or a shuttle service in terms of dropping off multiple times. So it'll be a different model from the wagon wheel, so to speak. Uh, we will try to get the students in as expeditiously as possible but at the same time, we're going to stagger the arrivals and dismissals. Will this eat into the school day? Most definitely. But as the state has made crystal clear, they control the 180 days, uh, the districts get to control the minutes of the day. So certainly it may be a challenge at the beginning of the year. Hopefully we will increase our efficiency as the, the year goes along, but our intent is to stagger uh, the arrivals and dismissals. Next question that was popular, will the school buildings and school buses be clean, disinfected on a regular basis? Yes, all high touch areas will be cleaned at least three times a day, approximately every two hours. The custodians will be cleaning uh, the hallways, the outside uh, of the buildings, so to speak, uh, the hall, uh, high touch areas uh, in, that, uh, in the buildings and school buses will be disinfected twice daily. I know the literature says once daily, but we're going to disinfect the buses after each uh, arrival and dismissal runs. Uh, we talked about this already. Speaking of school buses, will the students arrive in a staggered manner? Uh, yes, uh, that is our intent. Some districts are opening up multiple entrances and having multiple screeners. We may do that to a certain extent, especially at the high school, as we always have but uh, we do not want to bypass all our hard work on safety and security, uh, bypassing the single points of entry. So instead, we are going to deal with the staggered arrivals and dismissals, in part, as I said, because we're working with those concentric circles that the inside buses closest to the school will probably be coming in more frequently than the buses that are sent out uh, to the per far perimeter of an attendance zone. Will parents have the option of transporting their children to school? Yes, uh, as we indicated the survey results that about 50% of our families are going to elect not to have their children ride the bus. And certainly that does not hurt our feelings. We will be putting one child per seat near the windows. There's high backs on those seats, which will certainly act as sneeze guards. Uh, but uh, we also know that uh, uh, by doing that, we decrease the capacity on the buses. Families uh, with siblings in the same household can sit in the same seat, but uh, we would probably prefer to do one per seat uh, next to the window, and we will try to keep the windows open on the buses as much as possible. Speaking of cleaning, will teachers and staff members be asked to clean the inside of their classrooms? Yes, alcohol cleaning wipes will be provided for each classroom in addition to hand sanitizer. Cleaning is not permitted when the students are inside of the room. So the different buildings, especially middle schools and high schools in grades six through 12, will have to be very strategic and tactical about how they dismiss classes, uh, that the students socially distance in the halls, and that the teachers have ample time to be able to uh, wipe down, the, again, the high touch areas inside each classroom. 
Next popular question, what will happen when a student exhibits COVID-19 symptoms? The student will report to an isolation room before being picked up by a parent, guardian, or family member. The isolation room is required to have supervision, in this case, uh, who will report to the school nurse. Uh, so we will try to isolate. If a student exhibits a high temperature, they will be uh, put uh, aside, so to speak. We, in many cases, will probably retest with a digital thermometer rather than a thermo scan just to make sure we're correct. Uh, but then if they are exhibiting symptoms, uh, family members will be called to uh, pick up the children uh, during the day. Will some uh, special areas conduct instruction outdoors? In all likelihood, yes. Uh, as you may have heard in the literature, physical education and vocal music will require 12 foot social distancing radiuses. So uh, we expect uh, this, a lot of this will occur outdoors, whether permitting or in our large instructional spaces. Uh, this will apply to recess at the elementary levels as well. So I certainly think being able to capitalize on our uh, grounds will be the way to go uh, in terms of getting fresh air, whether it's mass breaks, but also to give the children a little exercise. If more than 50% of families elect a remote option, will you consider bringing in the other students more often? Yes and no. I mean, yes, because we are keeping all of the options available to us going forward, but no, because uh, we have to allow for those parents on that remote learning to be able to pick the hybrid option as well. So technically a seat will have to be saved. That's why we're talking about a marking period at a time. We're willing to keep an open mind, but we also know there are some restrictions that are going to prohibit returning all of the students at any one given time. And if you really read some of the other school districts, their plans are contingent upon having 50% or more of their families pick uh, the remote learning model. Next question, the cohorts were created alphabetically based on the last name of the oldest child in, in the household. So then the big question, and a lot of you have turned in, uh, there were over uh, 300 uh, questions on Let's Talk, probably 200 of which were about this. Will students be allowed to switch cohorts before school begins in order to accommodate family schedules, neighborhood pods, friendships, childcare needs? Unfortunately, the answer is no. We had to get planning, as I said earlier. I referenced that little questionnaire at the beginning of August we had to put pencil to paper. So for all good reasons or bad reasons, uh, we ended up doing it alphabetical. We started uh, generating the class lists. So uh, we're willing to uh, consider things going forward, but we have to see how the chips fall. Uh, let's say there's a class of 20. Uh, we divide the class into 10 and 10 in terms of the hybrid model. In one of the cohorts, only three of the 10 students show up. Uh, in the other cohort, so let's say all 10 of the students show up and that the other seven students are all on remote instruction. Conceivably, we could accommodate some of those requests and we'll have to take them at the time uh, case by case basis. Uh, but think about this, if you're in the 10, it's easy to switch to the three to try to balance things out. If your family finds yourself in the three, it's going to be difficult to add to the side that has the 10, especially when there may be only 10 desks in the room. I use that just as a, an example to illustrate that, uh, you know, we're trying to keep an open mind through all of this, but and to accommodate individual requests, but we just don't know how the chips are going to fall for the classrooms. Will students change classes according to the bell schedule? Yes and no. At the secondary level, 6 through 12, the students will change classes. We're trying to keep as many FM electives and classes going as possible. At the elementary level, K-5, students will remain in self-contained classrooms for the most part. Even special areas will cycle in and out uh, of the classroom. Who will coordinate the COVID-19 testing? The school district will work with Onondaga County. The protocols are listed on our website now, including the Onondaga County uh, letterhead. Uh, so we will be uh, coordinating with them. Uh, staff members will be encouraged to be tested. Uh, students obviously will need uh, parent permission is my understanding. 
but more details will be forthcoming from Onondaga County in terms of those sites. I imagine a larger school district like FM would, uh, we would be awarded our own site in a parking lot uh, where smaller districts such as neighboring Fabius Pompey, Tully and Lafayette may find, uh, you know, they have to share a particular site that's equidistant from all of them. So again, that ties into my last answer. Staff members will be encouraged to be testing. Students may uh, participate with the consent. And so more information will be forthcoming. Will the school communicate with staff and families when there's a confirmed positive case? Uh, yes, the school district will make some information available, obviously not the name of the particular student, but uh, we will let uh, families know there's a confirmed case within the building. Onondaga County will then conduct the contact tracing investigation. It may end up closing a classroom, it may end up closing one of our buildings, or it may end up closing the entire district, depending upon uh, the contact tracing. And that's one of the reasons for the temperature checks and the periodic screenings is to be able to uh, get that information to help Onondaga County who will be responsible for the contact tracing. Will the school building or school district close? As we said, uh, it'll be up to the County Department of Health uh, with the resurgence of the virus in the area or the region. It's certainly conceivable that the governor would close schools. So we just do not know uh, what we're gonna be dealing with. If a class or school building is placed in quarantine, will the teachers and students participate in remote learning? Yes, uh, remote learning will be the default there, assuming everybody's healthy. We do not want to compel anybody to either teach or to be a student and learn in a class uh, if they're ill. Uh, but uh, if we're under a quarantine period, this would allow students and teachers to continue their instruction using the remote platform. Uh, if a student or staff member tests positive, when will they be able to return to school? As uh, Onondaga County Department of Health says, it will require a negative test uh, for COVID or clearance from their physician, uh, one or the other or both. So uh, we do not control that. Uh, it certainly will be coordinated by the medical professionals uh, testing to that individual being ready and cleared to return. Uh, one of the other popular questions, what will happen to after school, extracurricular activities, clubs, extra help, things like that, interscholastic athletics, after school extracurricular activities, unfortunately will not occur. Uh, that means no late bus runs, uh, no enrichment period, no clubs at this point in time. Interscholastic athletics, as you know, has been postponed to September 21st at the earliest for fall sports, but the New York State Public High School Athletic Association has indicated and foreshadowed, I think, in their latest memo that in all likelihood, if the 21st gets pushed back, uh, I believe the next fallback position is possibly winter sports being January, February, fall sports, March, April, and spring sports may in June with no state playoffs, but just trying to get some competition started again. But again, it's, it's unlikely at this point, and they've kicked the can down the road to the 21st uh, before they have to make a decision. And the 21st is not for games, it's just for practices at this point. Will school hallways and staircases have one directional travel? Uh, yes, the principals and their teams are planning accordingly. Uh, they will determine their own pedestrian traffic flow patterns. We do not have any cookie cutter buildings. So, but we have ordered uh, four decals uh, to expedite the movements. We've ordered the polycarbonate shields for the offices, uh, much like we see at any retail stores or grocery stores. Uh, in terms of uh, prote uh, protecting uh, both individuals that may be talking about something such as in, in the main office. We have ordered some polycarbonate uh, barriers for the use on our instructional tables. Uh, where appropriate, we are using desks, uh, even in the cafeteria. So even though uh, at the K-5 level, food service will probably be delivered to the classrooms in all likelihood, Students six through 12 will go to the cafeteria. They will be eating in desks. It'll look like a large study hall. So I know uh, in the media, they said uh, parents want the socialization and the kids returning 
uh, you know, in that uh, format, uh, it will not, we will not be using the long tables uh, or round tables in the cafeterias that will uh, encourage congregation of students. They will look like a study hall format. Uh, will the school district offer orientation programs like Link Crew uh, for students entering the high school? I believe each level is looking at orientation programs for the students. So more information will be forthcoming. So whether it's kindergarten, grade five or grade nine, I do believe that uh, all the principals are taking a look at that. It may be remotely, it may look a little different, uh, maybe uh, instead of spending part of a day, it's only an hour uh, for the little kindergartners. There's been a lot of discussion at this point. So I know those plans are being finalized and we'll try to get that information out to you as soon as possible. Uh, Wednesdays, we talked about already, uh, student parents office hours. It'll be similar to last spring. Uh, so Wednesdays may look a lot uh, like last spring, uh, but it's our intention that Mondays and Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays step up our game in terms of being able to take it and, and go forward. And then last but not least, we'll open it up to questions now uh, from all of you. Uh, but if for some reason, oh, that's, uh, cancel a lot of that, uh, but if you have questions, please email me or use the Let's Talk dialog. So let me try to get the screen back for everybody. As far as the uh, chat feature, I said our district clerk, Sarah Gridley, uh, will be controlling that uh, from her desk. I ask though, in terms of the guidelines, that uh, questions and comments about individual students I would ask you to direct to the school building and the building principals. Um, I, I think it's gonna be important given sometimes in the board uh, meeting, if you watch that, uh, we will reserve the right to paraphrase, uh, certainly omit uh, questions that uh, the censor uh, might find uh, offensive. So uh, I would prefer no profanity or inappropriate content content of this, but we will edit that out. I know that uh, some individuals were upset uh, because there's so much emotion tied in with this and we understand that. Again, we've put the best plan forward back given the guidance on July 13th and July 16th. We're keeping an open mind. We've made changes to it already. So I do sense the emotion, uh, but at the same time, uh, we need your input too, just like we've told the faculty, we wanna get as much input and to make the plan better. My line is if we can build a better mousetrap, we should build a better mousetrap. Uh, so we ask you to stay informed. Uh, we may not have all the answers today. I'll certainly allow members of my team to chime in here. Uh, we know there is no one size fits all, but we've tried to get as much feedback as possible, put forth uh, the best plan uh, that we can. We know we're not gonna make everybody happy. That is crystal clear uh, between all the teachers that we have and staff members, 700 plus and all the families, uh, we would need 5,000 plans uh, to make everybody happy. Unfortunately, we were asked to put together three plans uh, for the state uh, and uh, we're, we're making the best use of uh, our facilities and what we have and trying to collaborate and work together. Uh, so I ask your indulgence in working with us and staying informed as we go forward. So District Clerk, if, do we have some questions? We certainly do. Uh, first question, how will attendance be taken for elementary students at a daycare or other such childcare when they cannot log on until the late afternoon or evening? I can answer this or Laurel can jump in. We're using our learning management system, Schoology. For all its good points and its bad points, Schoology will allow us to track uh, student usage. So when a student is in a remote setting, whether it's that Wednesday or for the opposite cohort, uh, believe it or not, we'll be able to identify if a student has uh, uh, logged on to work on some asynchronous assignments or what have you. So we will be using that for our attendance purposes. Is that right, Laurel? I see you nodding. Yes, 
we're still talking about various scenarios, but that that's the easiest way for us to track exactly when a student is in an actual course and when they've actually logged into Schoology. Thank you. Next question, and we've had a number of them, um, so I'm going to combine them. What is the time frame for late arrival and early dismissal, as well as the school start times? Uh, transportation just released that uh, information. Uh, I can let some of the others speak to that. Uh, I unfortunately have not committed that to memory. It was just the other day here, but we're very similar to what we were before. It's just trying to stagger out. We will get that information out and uh, to the parents, but we're trying to separate uh, the vehicular traffic flow from the buses. So the bus de transportation department had given us their best estimates. Uh, based on the 50% ridership to get the buses in and deployed. So in some cases, parents will arrive after. Uh, in some cases, parents will arrive before uh, the buses. And I know that information uh, will get posted as soon as possible. We'll put that on the website, hopefully within the next few days here. Anybody else that I, in terms of the days, they'll be very similar to give or take five or 10 minutes here or there. Okay, thank you. Next question. Masks will be worn at all times except lunch and mask breaks. Will the breaks be scheduled to assure all students have breaks throughout the day? And is there consistency in each building for the breaks? A uh, great question. The buildings are working with their faculty and their teams to uh, come up with those uh, mask breaks. Uh, we want to provide as much outdoor air as possible, again, weather uh, permitting. Um, and again, it's masks and the social distancing. So let's not forget that. Uh, sometimes, again, over lunch period, even though the cafeteria may look like a large study hall on a college campus uh, and the students may have their masks off while they're eating, they still will be six feet apart uh, from the next student. So that's why it is masks and social distancing, but I certainly trust the building principals and the faculty will work out the details for the individual mask breaks uh, within the building. Next question. What is the instructional model and time expectation for elementary students on remote days? As previously mentioned, many students will be in daycare until the evening. I can take a stab at that. And then if Dr. Coughlin wants to jump in uh, for remote days, let's start with the Wednesday. Uh, last spring, and, and some people loved it, some people hated it. Uh, the feedback, believe it or not, was mixed. We followed a homebound model. So it was two hours for the secondary level, one hour at the elementary level. Not that that was hard and fast, but we didn't want the children to be overwhelmed with multiple assignments. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was quality and not just quantity. So more wasn't necessarily better. And so we tried to organize our instruction in the spring as to not to overwhelm families that had to support the children in the evening or children themselves. Uh, so we followed that homebound model. That being said, Wednesdays may look very similar to what the spring looked like. As far as the other days of the week, we intend, and I know Dr. Kaufman has been working with the teacher leaders and the principals uh, to try to organize the instruction. Uh, obviously, there will be some synchronous, there will be some videos upon occasion. It's going to look different every day. It's probably gonna look different starting from September. And as we go through till June, we will be adding to our repertoire. We've looked at videos from outside vendors to try to help teachers, but Again, we're trying to make it manageable for the families that have their children at daycare during the day and may only be able to help them in the evening. Dr. Coughlin, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yes, we will be putting up on the website uh, draft schedules at the specific to the, and that <clears throat> we should have those up by Friday. Again, we're, we're still working on, on all of those. At specific to the question about elementary, um, it will look more of a like a block schedule. There will be opportunities for checking in with live streaming. Uh, 
and class meeting type activities. There will also be uh, video recorded lessons. So if, uh, and that will be available for all students and that will be an integral part of the instruction. So it will be a combination within a block schedule. Thank you. Next question, will parents be notified which buildings and areas cannot accommodate the recommended MERV 13 filters? Uh, Mr. Furlong, I know Mr. McCarty has been on top of this. I don't know if either one of you want to. Yeah, I mean, um, we're gonna be trying to use MERV 13 filters uh, anywhere we can. Uh, we are constrained by the size of those filters they just won't fit in many of the unit ventilators that are in classrooms. Uh, we do plan on uh, using, in that case, a MERV 9 filter. Uh, in addition, we plan on uh, increasing the outside air flow in those rooms. Uh, Russ, I don't know if you want to add to that at all. Yeah, certainly. Um, most of the uh, airflow we have uh, are set up with outside air dampers, both of the unit vents and with the fan coil units around the district, they predominantly are set at 10%. We're increasing the uh, percentage of outside air on those dampers to 30% or more to uh, drastically increase the amount of outside air that's coming into those spaces. Thank you, Bill and Russ. Next question. How will the online instruction be conducted via Zoom of live in-person sessions? I can answer that, Mary. Um, right now we're, we're using Google Meet um, because we don't have to have a separate account created for students and teachers. And we're still working and testing out all the features as they keep changing those features and adding them. Who knows, we might have to go to Zoom at some point, um, but right now it's Google Meet is our, our platform. And those that can record the sessions too. Thank you, Laurel. We have a multi-part question. If I understand correctly, saliva pool testing will be used to monitor asymptomatic cases and testing is voluntary. When will saliva pool testing be available and how will it be done? Uh, great question. Uh, for those of you that were watching the video uh, stream as Sarah set it up before nine o'clock, uh, you may have noticed that I arrived right at nine o'clock. Uh, my tardiness was because I was meeting with the other BOCI superintendents and that was a topic of discussion uh, that we're still waiting for Onondaga County Department of Health to give us information on the surveillance testing and what that will entail. We are, it's our understanding uh, I don't think this is a violation of insider trading that SUNY Upstate Medical is looking at a new machine to help with the pooled saliva testing that will be available and installed hopefully by the end of this month. Um, so uh, the details are still forthcoming. I don't think Onondaga County Department of Health is withholding anything. I think uh, the landscape is changing as we speak. But the idea was to do the surveillance testing uh, quite often and then if there is a confirmed uh, case to be able to drill down uh, to the specifics, whether it's the teachers, staff, students. Uh, so I think they wanna monitor that. And then again, as I said earlier, that's the one thing we heard from our physicians advisory committee and I cannot thank them enough. Uh, it was very intimidating uh, for me to be in uh, on the Zoom call with all of them and to have all that expertise in, in the room. And that's the one thing they made loud and clear. Testing, testing, and more testing just to keep a pulse on this, no pun intended. And so we will wait for those details. We will post that information as soon as we hear, but uh, I agree, it'll be the surveillance testing and then finally, uh, you know, the molecular testing, so to speak, to be able to drill down specifically um, to see where the the infection is. Good question. I have two more questions on the saliva testing. What percentage of the school population must participate in volunteer testing to effectively monitor asymptomatic spread and who will pay for it? 
Great question. I don't know until I have the details from the Onondaga County Department of Health. Uh, we were all uh, on a conference call with the county executive who indicated that some of those details are still forthcoming, uh, whether it would be incumbent on the health uh, insurance of a particular individual, whether it's student or teacher, whether it would be incumbent upon the district to cover those costs. Again, uh, I do not have that information at this time. I'm hoping that uh, we do see that information shortly. Next question. How are special education student needs being addressed remotely if children are in a child care center? Lisa, do you wanna? I was trying to unmute. We will be having uh, the staff in each of the buildings will be able we'll be having conversations with parents to determine the needs of the student and what the uh, special education program and related services will look like. So we will be doing that in conjunction with parents. Thank you, Lisa. Next question. Some teachers have obtained doctor's notes exempting them from wearing masks. Will parents be informed if their children will interact with these teachers? That's a good question. I don't know, Mr. Gordon, anything on that? I, Mr. Gordon. I, I have no, um, I have, I have no doctor's notes uh, that allow a teacher to not wear a mask at all. There is one that allows them to wear a shield. I will certainly let the parents, uh, that will be uh the building principal who may let the parents know that for the shield that's required by doc by a doctor but that is a doctor's note but there's no there's no teacher's notes and i'm actually looking at them all in front of me that has any uh uh teacher asking to not wear any protective uh, equipment so that to my knowledge will not be happening thank you mr gore and i wasn't trying to put him on the spot as you can imagine he's been dealing with uh uh, the vacancies for the summer, some teachers are electing to do a medical leave, others uh, an unpaid uh, child care leave. Uh, so he has been uh, working very diligently to fill those vacancies. So that is something we're trying to keep abreast on, just like parents have the option of remote uh, instruction or hybrid, teachers certainly have their collective bargaining agreement and all the different items that are in there uh, as tools available to them. And then it's uh, left to the district to be able to fill any of those vacancies. And like everybody on the screen, we've been working diligently, including Mr. Gordon, and, uh, in his case, trying to fill those vacancies, so. Next question, will remote learning be taught by FM teachers and will all courses be available? I can take this. Um, at the present time, we are having all courses taught by FM teachers. There is a possible option through BOCES, but uh, that is something that we could consider. But right now, our priority has been FM students working with, with FM teachers, and we're working hard to make that happen. Also, by assuming responsibility for those remote students, we are able to maintain the majority of our program and electives. Um, so that was a, a really a driving factor in our decision making about models. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Are students required to wear a mask when participating in physical activity or instruction? or PE instruction, what precautions are you taking in the event of hyperventilation? Uh, that's a good question. My understanding is uh, it'll be dependent. If we're outside in fresh air and uh, 12 foot or more, uh, certainly a mask break could be in order uh, based on uh, the activity. Uh, if we're in clement weather or closer proximity, uh, masks will be on, but I would assume there would be less exertion that may be focused on other skill sets uh, in terms of just the hand-eye coordination type activities and so forth. But I would leave that to the discretion 
of the teachers. Uh, certainly we would not want children to hyperventilate uh, or have difficulty breathing because they were exerting themselves and had to wear a mask. So I think we're gonna have to change our instruction, not just in the core areas, but in the special areas as well. Um, and that includes physical education. What happens if my child is placed in a class with others who have doctor's notes not to wear masks? Uh, if they are not required to wear masks, I do not believe we're, Lisa, we just talked about this yesterday. There um, potentially will be some students that are high need or have are medically fragile or have um, some other uh, extenuating circumstances, for example, they are not able to take the mask off themselves that would have a doctor's note uh, stating that they are not able to wear a mask. Again, we haven't had those uh, requests come in yet, but we cannot discriminate. And if a child is not able to wear a mask, um, then we need to assess the situation. And our plan right now is to provide additional PPE, protective equipment for staff members uh, that are working with the child. And again, we are still looking at the social distancing of six feet. How will social dis I'm sorry. How will social distancing be maintained if uh, during the temperature screening process? Uh, we're hoping to, as I said, stagger the arrival of the buses. We've purchased uh, floor decals. Uh, we will do it upon entrance to the building. Obviously, we don't want the students waiting outside in a torrential downpour or a blizzard, but we will have to uh, mark the spaces out and, and insist upon social distancing. And the intent is to screen them very quickly. We should be able to move through uh, fairly rapidly, even at the high school with their traditional three entrances that are monitored by staff in the morning, uh, we should be able to get the students in fairly quickly. There should not be a long uh, line uh, waiting for that screening. I would also, if I could just add that, that we're talking about m multiple uh, people doing that, not just a one or two. So we'll have, uh, depending on the size of the school and, and, and how many students are arriving, we'll have the appropriate number of uh, staff out to take care of that to make sure it moves very quickly. And uh, not, uh, I would also like to give a shout out. Uh, Mr. Gordon has also worked uh, with the school nurses and our school physician and thanks to the Board of Education uh, and the help of the Physicians Advisory Committee uh, we will be at Monday's board meeting uh, putting forth the name of a physician to serve as our COVID coordinator. I think one of the few districts in the area, if not the only one, to do so. And it's a parent who's a physician, will act as boots on the ground to help our school physician and school nurses through this. So I think it's a unique uh, feature for FM. Uh, we're always asked by our Board of Education, is this an FM plan? for the FM community as opposed to other area school districts. And I think this is a unique feature. Again, giving credit to the Board of Education and all the folks you see in front of you for helping to make that a reality. So just a thank you to Mr. Gordon for all his work to coordinate uh, all of that uh, with the school nurses and the school physician. We have a question regarding the hand sanitizer that will be provided to students specifically um, awareness of the toxic hand sanitizers that have been recalled or discouraged for use. I can answer that. We have none of that product. It's all alcohol-based. Alcohol we have none of that product. Is there a threshold for the number of students or staff who test positive that will trigger a move to fully online learning? And what is that number? Great question. We do not have that number yet from Onondaga County uh, Department of Health. Uh, I did learn, as you may recall, we were in the media uh, regarding uh, uh, football 
practice at a local park and I was surprised to find out that in the contact tracing, it's the 48 hours prior uh, to the symptoms being present. So I think a lot of that will depend upon the contact tracing, if there are any gaps in the tracing. Onondaga County said that they would, uh, when there is a gap in the tracing, uh, much like we just saw in the recent newspaper about uh, hepatitis A at a restaurant at Destiny USA, when there is a gap, they inform the public, we would do the same. But what would actually be the number that would precipitate a closure, you know, and again, as you've heard me say before, this is balanced on the head of a pin. In theory, it might be very contained, but in theory, it may permeate through the entire building, depending on if a student or staff member comes in contact with multiple individuals. So I think a lot will be dependent on the contact tracing and the 48 hours before that individual was symptomatic. Next question, will masks be available in all classes in the event of a dropped or sneezed in mask? I believe the answer is yes. Next question, you said you are temperature checking all students on arrival and screening them periodically. Have you abandoned the concept of families completing a self-help daily screening via an app? We had talked about that. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. We've based on our, our meetings with our uh, medical board, uh, it was recommended that we not use what some other districts are using, which is a home app. We certainly reserve the right to change that plan as we move forward. But the plan right now is to have all students temperature checked as they get off the bus at their school and not use an app for, uh, we are using an app for staff uh, because they have multiple questions to answer as required by law, but we are not planning on using an app for students at this time. Next question, what repercussions exist if teachers or students are not wearing PPE? Uh, this is a question that had come up uh, before uh, and we had asked our legal counsel, the code of conduct, the district code of conduct, gives the building administrators latitude to enforce this. So uh, it will be a violation. It will be in subordination regarding the health ordinances. So it would be dealt with uh, with the progressive discipline uh, if the student corrects the behavior all the way to suspension if needed. So uh, our legal counsel said we did not have to modify the code of conduct. We are putting our student handbooks together. Uh, thanks to our communications department uh, that has a COVID section, but we are not tipping over the apple cart and redoing everything based on COVID because uh, the building principals already have that latitude. It would be considered insubordination and would be dealt with accordingly. Next question. Will kindergartners have any opportunity to see, socially distance, meet, or virtually meet their teacher or classmates prior to the first day of kindergarten? Uh, yes, that was one of my last slides. Dr. Coughlin can chime in. I know the building principals are anxious. Everybody's anxious and wanting the students to return. Uh, so I know the new ones to every building, uh, they're trying to do something special, whether it's remotely or in person. Dr. Coughlin, do you have any more details to share? Uh, correct. The elementary, middle, and high school principals are working on opportunities for kindergartners, fifth graders, and ninth graders uh, new to their to their buildings, and that information will be forthcoming from the buildings. What happens if a child has a temperature over the threshold? If they have a temperature over the threshold when they get off the bus, as was mentioned through the thermal check, they will be checked a second time with a uh, what's considered a more accurate thermometer by the school nurse. Um, and then if their temperature is above 100, as required in the guidance from DOH and SED, they will be sent home. That's not a local decision. That's, a, that's guidance from the state. How will cleaning of bathrooms in elementary school classrooms work as they are used often throughout the day? Russ or Bill, would you like to respond to that? 
Victor, I can chime in and then Russ, you can uh, add to it. Um, we are planning on uh, cleaning high touch areas, including bathrooms, uh, two to three times a day, uh, in addition to their normal cleaning. Uh, we are using uh, various uh, disinfection methods, uh, not only during the day, but in the evening hours. And of course, we're going to have a, a deeper cleaning uh, every Wednesday. Uh, anything to add to that, Russ? Uh, yes, during the times when the class is out of the uh, classroom, we can go in and, and clean those bathrooms during like lunch breaks or if they're outside. Uh, we can't go in and clean during the uh, while there's students there, but we'll be taking any opportunity when there's no students in the classroom to get in there and clean the bathrooms in the elementary classes. Next question. Are teachers able to and willing to help younger grades with appropriate mask placement and other adjustments? I believe so. I mean, this is all new to us and especially for the little ones. Uh, Describe the hallway policy for transitioning classrooms for grades six through 12. It'll be building specific. Uh, again, we purchased the floor decals, uh, the uh, polycarbonate uh, barriers for offices. So whether it's one-way directions in the hallways or stairwells, each building principal is uh, taking a look at that uh, and it'll be specific to the building. Some, I'm sorry, I'll add too that some, uh, some of the uh, buildings will dismiss odd even classrooms or in the case of the high school, house one, house two, uh, at staggered intervals as well. So we may end up uh, eating into the period, uh, class period by having more transition time to ensure the social distancing. If a parent is COVID positive, how will the district ensure those children are not coming to school if they're asymptomatic? If a parent is COVID positive, I mean, we would rely on the parent uh, because of the exposure to quarantine their children accordingly. If they have a positive confirmed test, they should quarantine the child. Uh, they may elect to send them in. That's where I think the saliva testing, the pool testing. That's what our Physicians Advisory Committee said about testing, testing and more testing, but uh, it's going to be dependent on that testing in order to try to narrow and isolate. So if a parent is not cooperative and decides to send their child in, uh, when they know they have a positive test and they should be quarantining themselves and the children or anybody in their family who's been exposed, uh, we don't have obviously control of that. All we can do is work with the county in terms of the surveillance testing and to try to stay on top of it. So I would, could I just add that I, I think uh, Dr. Tice, I think that's a great question that we need to get clarification from Dr. Gupta in the county because anytime there's a positive test in the county, uh, they're the ones who do the contact tracing and work with that family. So clearly they would be giving an order to that family that everybody quarantine until tested. Um, I'm hopeful that they would also notify the school, but we can find out. That would be uh, that would be our expectation. Thank you, sir. We have someone wondering about the availability of school supply lists. The uh, principals will be sending those out. They're uh, finalizing the school supply lists and. Um, by the end of this week or the beginning of next week, that information will be coming out or, and available on the website. Right. In the event of power outage or internet connectivity issues while online learning, how do we report this so our child doesn't get penalized and are the classes recorded? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, if, you're, if a child's having problems with their Wi-Fi at home or connecting, then they should definitely contact the teacher so the teacher knows that, they're, that the assignment might be a little later. Also, um, they can c contact their 
their internet provider. Um, we do have a help desk also, but we are limited in being, being able to troubleshoot home access um, when it's on a different in, a network. We can do some basics, um, but I would definitely have them call their carrier. If Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday will be synchronous learning, if I have three children, does that mean I need three computers at the same time? Great question. I'm pleased to announce that thanks to Laurel and Dr. Coughlin uh, that, and Mr. Furlong, who controls the purse strings uh, for getting Chromebooks for everybody. So if you are, have a household with multiple children, uh, we are now a one-to-one -one school. We certainly had to uh, rearrange things within the budget in order to pay for that. Uh, but uh, we've tried to defer uh, some decisions to later uh, to allow us to get those Chromebooks. And unlike what you've heard in the media, we got that order out early in the summer. So we tried to get our foot in the door and beat everybody else to it. Uh, so hopefully we will be taking delivery of those Chromebooks shortly. And just to add, kindergarten through second grade will be receiving iPads. Oh, thank um, you. So, yep. And then the rest, uh, Chromebooks. And, um, and we have also an, uh, a remote system for some of our high tech type software of Photoshop or Envisioneer or CAD drawing programming where students can, can use a Chromebook. Um, in the past, you've had to download the software, but we should be able to remotely access those products. And I just wanted to clarify that it's not synchronous instruction all week long. Teachers will be using a variety of um, teaching modalities. There will be synchronous opportunities, asynchronous opportunities, and that will um, look different at every grade level and in every course. Uh, will high school students be allowed to eat at any time at their desk? That would be a great question for Dr. Kilmer. I do not believe so. I believe they're looking at using a uh, uh, wellness period in the middle of the day. As you can imagine, the bell schedule is going to get reworked. Uh, there is no activity period at the end of the day. so. It may afford us an opportunity to put a wellness period in the middle of the day in order to provide students with that uh, mask break and be able to eat. So unlike the past where students were able to eat in classrooms, uh, I think we're going to probably have to rethink that uh, depending on the classroom. Some teachers may permit it, but I also know for the most part, uh, we're gonna be hard pressed and so I know Dr. Kilmer has been very creative and his team and trying to look at uh, wellness period in the middle of the day. How will social distancing be maintained in cafeterias? As I said earlier, uh, it'll, it's not gonna look like a cafeteria. It's gonna look like a study hall with desks. There will be no tables. They will be six feet apart and it will be monitored and they will be eating at a desk. How will increased vehicle traffic and congestion going to be handled at drop off and pick up? Uh, we need to ask the parents indulgence to follow the schedules that will be, will be put forth by the building principals. We're trying to stagger the buses and that means we need parent compliance to try to hit their mark as well or else they run the risk of their child being in a long line for temperature screening. So. We must ask your indulgence and cooperation in trying to pull this off. This is all new ground for everyone involved. So punctuality and timeliness will be critical. We have received a number of questions asking what the remote instruction days will look like, synchronous versus asynchronous schedules and so forth. The elementary students, again, will be following a block schedule. The middle and high school students will be following a, a modified uh, bell schedule. And those will be posted on the website probably by Friday, as I mentioned. There will be a combination of possibilities, synchronous learning, asynchronous learning, 
Teachers have the option to use live streaming. They will be using video recorded lessons. They will be using uh, discussion features and students will be interacting through discussions and blogs. And additionally on Wednesdays, we will be delivering print materials and be interacting with students in, in that way as well. Um, we have, we will be continuing to work with, with teachers on the development of those plans. Thank you, Dr. Hello. Hello. Oh, you're on mute, Sarah. Thank you. Um, has FM considered buying tents for outdoor class time? I do not believe so, unless Mr. Furlong and Mr. McCarty have come up with something. Uh, I think we're going to try to avail ourselves of the fresh air and we'll have to dress accordingly. Uh, but uh, no, we have not. Uh, again, as I said earlier, the governor. I know he doesn't mention that in his daily press briefings, but is already uh, withholding 20% of the state aid, not just from FM, but from every other district. So we're really trying to control our expenditures. Uh, as I said earlier, the purchase of the Chromebooks, uh, the additional Chromebooks to allow one-to-one -one instruction came at the cost, the opportunity cost of something else. So the, the budget is very tight in terms of what we're able to do. And if I could add to that, we did take a, a brief look at that. Um, we just felt it was not practical, uh, given how uh, quickly the weather is going to turn colder. Uh, in addition, anything of that nature would still have to go through facilities planning for review and approval. And we just felt that by the time they would review it and approve it, it might be, uh, you know, middle of winter. Thank you, Bill. If teachers are being given specific expectations for synchronous and asynchronous teaching, will that be shared with parents so we can calibrate our expectations? Again, it would be the uh, teachers communicating their daily and weekly plans with with uh, their classes, just as we would do in an all in-person situation, teachers will be providing an overview of the week and expectations for students. And they would be um, putting forth what, what that week is going to look like and, and when there might be a class meeting and, and when they might be online and what uh, video students would be, would be watching and how they might be responding to a discussion blog. Um, but that, that would come out from the teachers with what they are planning and expecting of students for the week. We've had a number of questions regarding vocal and instrumental music instruction and how that will work and if it will be offered at all. To the extent possible, we are trying to maintain all of our programs, again, within the safety guidelines. Um, we are planning to provide uh, lessons. Um, those will be with modifications, obviously. Um, large group situations like uh, chorale or, and choruses um, would need to be in a very large space with the appropriate distancing. Again, to the extent possible, we are trying to maintain program. May students bring their own hand sanitizer? Good question. I don't know, Bill or Russ, have we heard anything on that? I don't, I, I have not heard anything on that. Yeah, um, we can we can double check on that. Uh, my understanding is that you know any use of hand sanitizer uh, has to be under uh, the supervision of uh, staff or faculty uh, by students. So uh, I think that we would want to try and control that. I know there was an earlier question about you know uh, hand sanitizer and students. 
uh, once again, hand sanitizer is not going to be issued to students. It's going to be issued to teachers um, and other uh, staff members who then will, you know, kind of watch the use by students. Uh, but we can double check on that to determine what the guidance is on that and get that information out. Thank you. Regarding one-to-one -one Chromebooks, do parents need to request the Chromebook or will it be automatically given to the student? Yeah, we will be assigning them to students. We do still have 250 that have not come back from the summer as today. So we might be, you know, having to modify that. Um, but yes, it, every student um, will be assigned one. And hopefully it will have a schedule soon. We, you know, hopefully they'll be on the desk or we'll have it available for them right from school. And is it my understanding, Laurel and Bill, there will be uh, optional insurance available, self-funded uh, by the district uh, because of the students transporting their Chromebooks back and forth. Certainly families are not obligated to take the insurance, but if something were to happen to the Chromebook, much like a textbook, they would be responsible for that. The insurance would allow, I'm assuming, a deductible uh, towards right, the, pur the purchase of a new Chromebook, a replacement, correct? Right. Yes, there'll be a, a yearly protection plan will be $40 and we have all the specifics on what it covers and how much a screen costs and a, a keyboard. And we'll have all the paperwork with that Chromebook along with the acceptable use policy for using that Chromebook um, when they receive that Chromebook. And they'll have a couple of weeks to fill that out and send that back in. So thank you both for coordinating that. Again, it's not obligatory by any stretch of the imagination, but it's uh, in terms of any of our material usage. Uh, it's a public good, it's a community good, and technically every textbook, every library book, every Chromebook, iPad belongs to the taxpayers in general. So just like we participate in a self-funded healthcare consortium for employees here, as well as throughout Central New York, this is sort of our own self-funded to try to mitigate the costs uh, over the entire population if again, families choose. We have two questions about fully remote. Um, how much live interaction will the students have with their teachers? And have we conducted stress tests to make sure we have enough bandwidth for this year? I can start with the stress test that we have been doing testing. Um, so it looks great right now. Again, you never know when we had um, some districts at online testing a couple of years ago and there was a, a cyber attack that came out of nowhere. Um, but we sh we've looked at all situations and we should be fine. And teachers will be interacting daily with all of their students that may not necessarily and will not be necessarily live every day. Again, through other means, um, they will be connecting with students that can be within a discussion um, and, and other opportunities um, that we have available to us. Thank you, Dr. Coughlin. You're right, it will be individualized by teacher. I mean, we said from the onset and the parents demanded it, we want FM teachers with FM students. So as our families expect, or if an older child has come through the system, I mean, every teacher is different. Teachers will use the tools in different ways. Uh, so it'll be peculiar to a particular course, subject, teacher. So we, we're not trying to lose that individuality. And I know Dr. Coughlin and the principals and instructional forums, our curriculum specialists have all worked hard to maintain that, maintain that FM branding. Uh, so, I mean, we're looking forward to delivering the whole slate of electives. Some districts, if you read the fine print, they're just offering core classes. They've cut back on all the electives and that's one thing we chose not to do here. So thank you for stressing that. Will students still be able to walk or ride a bike to school? Uh, yes. Socially distance, of course. How I, I worry, I have them be careful, tongue in cheek here around the Wellwood construction zone. So we will have it safe for everybody. But if you haven't had a chance to see the Wellwood facility, uh, you know, we will soon find out that uh, 
it has uh, progressed nicely uh, through the spring and summer and we will certainly take uh, precautions there, but uh, it is a construction zone. If it's remote learning, how many days a week and how many hours in a day? In the total remote option that parents may choose if they have health concerns about their child attending the hybrid model, the expectation is, again, the, the full day. That wouldn't be a full day online with a classroom teacher, but it would be a full day of instruction and, may, and uh, following a bell schedule of, of classes. Will the district be hiring more custodial staff to keep up with a higher demand of cleaning? Unless Russ or Bill tell me differently, I believe the answer is no, given the budget constraints, but I do believe it isn't just working harder, it's working smarter. So I know they purchased victory sprayers, disinfectants. I mean, we're really trying to be strategic and tactical about this and work smarter with the different products available. Is that true, gentlemen? It is correct. Uh, we do not anticipate adding any staff. We feel that the, the current workforce that we have is uh, quite capable of meeting the needs of the daily cleaning and disinfecting. Yeah, a what? lot of our, oops, sorry about that. Uh, a lot of our, uh, uh, support service has to do with events too and there's uh, none events going on so we'll be able to direct that uh, resource more towards cleaning so that'll help us out tremendously. Thank you Ross that's a good point I don't think I stressed it earlier right now without sports until the 21st and maybe longer as well as concerts or school shows uh, everything has been postponed. Uh, if you're in receipt of your school calendar this year, you may have noticed that uh, the events are not posted on that, uh, in part because uh, at this point they have been canceled. Sarah, I know we're running out of time here. Is there some final I've, questions? There are. Um, how will materials be provided to students who are remote learning? We uh, have the opportunity on Wednesdays to be delivering materials to students. Uh, there's a question regarding uh, substitute teacher training in terms of updated uh, health and safety guidelines. The, uh, the subs will receive uh, before the start of the year some general guidelines from the district regarding uh, protocols, health protocols in the building and, and those kinds of things. Um, things specific to the building, uh, they will get from the building when they arrive at the buildings. Um, some of our subs uh, sub in all buildings, uh, many of our subs sub in only particular buildings. So uh, and a lot of that will be very specific to the building, but the general uh, health and safety rules they will have uh, prior to the start of the school year. And we'll watch the same videos or have the opportunity to see the same videos that we're showing our teachers. Our final question is, you mentioned that masks are preferable, but will gaiters, buffs, or handkerchiefs be allowed as well? Uh, masks are preferable. I don't, do not believe we've received anything uh, indicating that the others are not allowed, uh, but as we all know, the landscape changes daily. So we will communicate that if we hear something, certainly the research, I believe, from Duke indicated that uh, the bandanas and gaiters are not as effective. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if the state issues some executive order indicating that those would not be allowed. Well, I thank you all for participating, not only my online uh, crew right here with me. Uh, your input has been invaluable, not just for this session, but uh, throughout the entire summer as we planned uh, accordingly. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, I remind you, we have two other parent meetings. If for some reason you think of another question, 
uh, or don't feel we've answered your question uh, satisfactorily, I encourage you to tune in later tonight at six o'clock. I feel like a television station here or one o'clock tomorrow uh, for a similar uh, interactive session. Uh, and if that doesn't work for you, our Let's Talk platform is available 24 seven, 365. Uh, for many of you who submitted questions in advance, we tried to include them on the uh, slideshow earlier. Uh, so a lot of you will, I know I haven't responded to those yet. I do those individually and personally. And as you can imagine with an inbox of about 300 plus, uh, I will respond with a general thank you for submitting the question, uh, not to avoid, but if there is a follow-up question, I'll encourage you to, to contact uh, me. Uh, we're able to keep the dialogue going, but hopefully we've been able to answer a lot of your questions today. Uh, and again, uh, we'll repeat uh, this presentation later tonight and tomorrow, and uh, we're all learning as we go forward. Uh, the one thing to remember is we're keeping an open mind. Yes, we had to put a plan together based on the NYSED uh, guidance, the 89 assurances. Uh, yes, we had to put something together that conform to the New York State Department of Health, the four areas that the governor talked about, and uh, we're working together. A pandemic's new to us, and thank goodness that it only comes around every 100 years or so, uh, but we are working together, and uh, I know it sounds cliche that we're all in this together, but it is collaborative, and uh, even though we will be breaking new ground, uh, I think you need to know your school district is keeping an open mind. We appreciate the feedback and suggestions. We know there's a lot of emotion. We know that no one plan is going to fit everybody's schedule, but uh, as we're fond of saying here, we had to put a stake in the ground. We had to start somewhere. The last thing you would expect from Fayetteville Manlius is to start to throw something together around Labor Day. Uh, we had to start planning in advance. And uh, again, a big thank you to the people you see on the screen and all of their teams uh, and the principals and the administrative cabinet uh, for really thinking this through and trying to put a plan together that addressed all of those survey responses. And again, we know individually it's not perfect for certain families, but collectively it's pretty strong and it's because of your input uh, that we're most appreciative. So I will give the obligatory uh, Zoom wave and thank you for participating and encourage you to reach out or to join us for one of the other parent presentations at six tonight or one o'clock tomorrow. Thank you.